So this talk is on your building's plan. Each plan is tailored towards that given building. Each building is supposed to have a plan. Uh, roughly about 185 buildings on campus have that right now. Updated. So what's in the plan? All kinds of great emergency stuff because it's an all-hazards plan. Like just a fire, what to do in a fire, what to do here, what to do there. It's all has all types of hazards that potentially could happen are inside this plan in some sort. The different emergencies this plan entails, fire, severe weather, bomb threats, earthquakes, chemical spills, utility outages, medical emergencies, and armed intruders slash workplace violence, which is what everyone wants to talk about every time. So, what are you supposed to do with these plans? Well, read them. <laughs> plans are great if you know what is inside the plan. So become familiar with the plan, assist anyone that may not be familiar with the plan, because people like to not plan for emergency. They just like to, oh, something's happening, what do I do now? And if anyone followed the, uh, the Hawaiian missile message, people just were running around in the streets after that message went out. I mean, I never had to plan for nuclear holocaust before, but probably not running around outside, kind of a good idea. <laughs> okay. Instructor responsibilities. People always ask, what as an instructor am I responsible to do in the event of an emergency? Well, if you hear the fire alarm go off, chances are you should evacuate because the emergency notification system has been activated for a reason, and it's signaling you to evacuate. So if the fire alarm were to activate, you should usher your class outside. If you get a Buckeye alert, you should follow those directions on that Buckeye alert text, whatever it says, shuttle, shelter in place, evacuate, depending on what that given message is. So when the Buckeye alert message is said, it's not just because we like to send them, because we really don't. There actually is good information in that text. And it may be just a generic message because we send it very quickly to make sure everyone's notified. But then a follow-up message is going to come very soon very soon afterwards. People with disabilities may be in your class at any given time. You're supposed to be able to confront them and help, not just, oh, okay, bye-bye. What do you do in event of an emergency on the third floor, second floor, if someone's in there with a wheelchair? Where do you put them? Where do you, what do you do? So that's all in the plan. So we have areas of refuge. Basically, those are places that are protected from the building's elements because of fire-related construction. Like this room here, we have doors, close those doors. Mind you, is this the safest place to be in the event of a fire? No. However, it's way safer than the hallway because you're sheltered from hazardous smoke and materials that may or may not be in the hallway. So the Buckeye Alert System, basically that is a, everyone thinks it's just text messaging, but we can actually do multiple things, about two dozen ways of communication. We can take over the web page, Twitter, Facebook, text messages, we can actually use sign boards now. Um, it actually, our system will now activate Franklin County's emergency system because Franklin County has unveiled a very new uh, emergency notification system that you can actually sign up for different areas or parts of the tax city. So I get a message that's only tailored to my area. Well, before people that necessarily came to Ohio State to work, but they weren't Ohio State affiliated, I said they worked at the subway. We couldn't really reach them, but now we can because if you sign up for Franklin County's alert system, we can actually send alerts to people that are in or around Ohio State. So it's multiple different systems that we like to send out in the event of an emergency. So everyone wants to know how do you register for the Buckeye Alert System. If you are an OSU-affiliated staff member, faculty, or student, you're automatically put in. It's an opt-out system, not opt-in. So you have to opt out of the system if you don't want those messages. So if you put your accurate information in, into PeopleSoft, then it will be able to be able to send messages. You can add more people, like let's say if you were to add a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, mother, doesn't matter. But you can have two different emails into the system if you go to go.osu slash Buckeye Alert. I was just going to jump in and say we're also working, uh, there's a the part of the Buckeye Alert system uh, is a computer notification. Um, we're working on rolling that out in our classrooms uh, here at the college as well so that if you are teaching a class uh, and you're in the middle of a presentation and your phone's over somewhere else, we're working so that these alerts will pop up on the screen 
uh, of the computer as well and interrupt you in class and make you see them. So that's another way we're, we're working to get this in front of you. Another system, the Buckeye Alert system, is that we can do desktop notifications, which is already unrailed in a few departments. All the pool cat classrooms have them on main campus. So if you're having a PowerPoint slide or whatever, or in your office, depending on if it's on your computer, it'll automatically pop up with a message. Buckeye Alert issued you whatever that text message text is, it's going to populate on that screen, and then you can close it underneath there's like a little button that says dismiss. So if you're giving a presentation, you can see that. Yes? This is a good time to remind everyone to be here, get a new cell phone if you have a new address. Uh, go into employee cell service and make sure that your contact information is up to date because that's the system that will, that's the numbers that we'll use to notify you with Buckeye Alert and other university notifications. Correct. So this is your floor coordinators for this actual building. Um, yeah, real briefly, you guys don't need to worry about writing these numbers down. These are more for our internal use. Um, essentially what's going to happen if there's an emergency, um, you're going to see the eight people you see on the screen here running around, or six people, however many there are of us. Um, we each have a primary um, role, uh, or each floor has a primary coordinator uh, and then an alternate coordinator. Basically, both of these people are going to be moving around, checking each floor that they're responsible for, um, just to make sure that everybody, you know, someone's not locked in their office with headphones on, uh, sleeping through a fire alarm or something like that. So we're, uh, if you see us coming around in a panic and we're, we're telling, barking orders at you, uh, just understand we're trying to make sure that everyone's getting safe and out of the way of the danger. So. Yeah, four coordinators will search in event, let's say a fire alarm goes off, they'll Quickly search if it's safe to do so on that given assigned area. However, they should, wherever they're at, it should always, everyone should take note of anyone that may or may not be evacuating for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Whether that be they can't physically evacuate, they didn't hear the notification, or they're just like, yeah, it's another room. So when they get outside, they can alert the uh, first responders, hey, there's someone on the second floor around room 212. Uh, and one other thing just to touch on um, uh, that Roy mentioned earlier, if you are in the middle of a class, there's a fire alarm. The, do not say, oh, it's probably just a false alarm. We're going to stay here. Uh, that puts, there's a lot of liability associated with that. Do not keep your class going in the event of alarm. Um, if you need to make up time, we'll figure it out. But, but don't, one of the worst things you can do is just write it off and be like, oh, it's probably nothing. We're just going to stay in class. It is a misdemeanor state of Ohio to stay in an alarmed building for whatever that alarm is, unless you know 100% it was a drill or it was an you know, actual like non-emergent situation, like you're testing or something like that. So I mean, they could potentially write a violation to you personally for not evacuating. I've never seen it happen before, but it's possible. Can we do the scenarios? You want to talk them over? Trevor? Uh, yeah, so go for it. Me? Yeah. Okay. You're in your office and you smell smoke. You look around and notice that a small fire has sparked around your power outlet. It is spreading rapidly and the room is filling with smoke. What do you do? Get out your tools. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of tools do you have? <laughs> Pretty polish. Pretty polish, yeah, that probably works. Circuit tested. So electrical fires are considerably hazard because you put water on it, you may or may not get electrocuted or shocked. Electrocuted means you're dead. Shocked means you're still alive but in pain. So uh, definitely don't put water on that. Uh, smoke is, depending on, I don't know what that definition is, if you smell smoke. If you see smoke, that's always way dangerous than if you smell it. Um, basically, you can. This building is new constructed, meaning we put sprinklers throughout. This entire building is wet sprinklers throughout. That's what these little uh, silver guys are hanging down. So basically, what those are is glorified heat detectors. They sense the heat, and then at 155 degrees, yep, the red, so 155 degrees, that glass, that little liquid in there will start to boil, break, and water will start free flowing from that, from that outlet only, not all of them at one time. There are systems like that, but none in this building. So just one sprinkler head activation. If it gets hot enough, so 155 degrees at the ceiling. Now, this room doesn't have any smoke detectors because we have glorified heat detectors, sprinkler heads. So the smoke may or may not trip the fire alarm. 
depending on where you are in the given building, in your personal office, probably will not because there's smoke detectors in the hallway by the elevator car, not in most common areas, not in actual occupant room space. So if you can put the fire up, per se, with your tools, <laughs> do so. If not, call 911 or call our non-emergency number, the 2121, and they'll send someone here. Or you can pull a pull station to activate the fire alarm. Basically, these are all, all the exits, meaning all the ones that go directly outside, or all the stairwell entrances on all the above or below grade levels. So you just pull this, fire alarm would activate. And that would cause the fire alarm to go off. Big red truck would show up, and you could go outside and say, hey, my electric outlet in room 12 is sparking and smoke's coming out, and there possibly some fire there. So what's a small versus large fire? Anyone seen a small fire before? Basically the size of two basketballs, or maybe your waste can is on fire in your office. Small. Use with some toaster oven. <laughs> toaster oven. <laughs> okay. Now, toaster oven fire is interesting, too, because in theory, that's energized, so if you put water on that, you might get shocked or electrocuted, depending on what the amps are. Given that, usually they're low, but depending on what that is. Now, a small fire, if you're trying to do stuff, feel comfortable enough, you can fight that fire appropriately, whether that with ABC fire extinguisher, which all these extinguishers in this building are ABC, so they can extinguish type A, type B, and type C fires. A is like ordinary combustibles, wood paper, things of that nature. B is your flammable liquids and gases, so like gasoline. And then C is anything energized, so you know, it's not conductive, so that stuff that's in those red extinguishers are non conductive, so it's not going to come back at you and shock your electrocution. So you always want to know what's on fire, and you always want to know what you're using to fight the fire, because sometimes bad things have happened, especially like research building applications and things of that nature. So you never want to fight a fire unless the alarm is actually going off because if you get hurt or incapacitated by the smoke or flames, no, if the alarm's not going off, chances are no one's coming to help you. So always want to leave for your personal safety first, and then if you want to come back, I highly recommend not doing that, but if you have your tools, you can use that. <laughs> So if you discover a fire, pull the nearest pull station and assist anyone in evacuating that you can. And take note of anyone that doesn't want to evacuate. As you make your way out, find the nearest first responder or build floor coordinator or building representative. So 30 people don't go to one firefighting person or one officer from the police department. And they can say, well, there's XYZ number of people in this building. Because if you help them, they don't have to search the whole building right away. They will, but they will be much faster response. Yeah, sure. Um, I feel like I've read in this awful fire that struck in Brooklyn uh, or in New York City that one of the problems was the fire spread rapidly through the building because they didn't close doors. Mm -hmm. Is that, like you said, if you have a small fire in your office, exit, close the door, leave the door open? Well, closing the door is going to compartmentalize that fire. So even if your door is not fire rated or you know, solid door, closing that's going to slow it down. So every time you close the door, you're getting more and more protection. So the way exits are designed in buildings are you go from the most dangerous spot to the least dangerous spot. So in your office, you're the most dangerous because you're actually with the fire. When you go out in the hallway, you're getting safer and safer and safer. If you close the doors behind you, that compartmentalizes that safety behind you. So all the danger is behind you. So yes, leave, close the doors, that compartmentalizes the smoke and the, and the fire. And it's going to increase the time. Now, if you're like rural Oklahoma, let's say, it might take a non-professional fire company to get to your location a long period of time because they got to wait. They got to wake people up. I was in one of these places. Oh, two o'clock in the morning. Okay, let me get my keys and drive over to the fire station. Get in that truck and drive there. Oh, look. Okay, fire's up because it's in the basement and everything else is completely collapsed. Let's go home. Here, Columbus is going to get very rapidly and quick. But if you can protect your building by closing your doors. That's the least damage to your property in the building. So yeah, close the doors. No, I see, sorry, oh, that's fine. Oh. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you want to close your windows. If, I don't know if any of the buildings in this any windows in this building open out to the outside. The reason why you want to close windows is for ventilation reasons. The, the less 
cleaned oxygen going in there, the less fuel to the fire. Anyone's been to a campfire where you do the fire, the fire gets bigger, right? So the same principle of the fire is in your building. You close the, shut off the oxygen to the fire, the fire goes out. So close windows, close your doors behind you as you leave, quickly see for anyone that needs assistance. Assistance, encourage others to evacuate. I don't know if people, I don't know if you have a lot of false alarms in this building. No? So everyone's not really compliant, complacent to, you know, I was just on the drill. Some buildings on campus, they have them all the time because they have research applications in there and somebody always does something, hey, you know, it's on a roof fire, emergency, something set up the systems. So luckily you don't have that problem either. Um, do you not use elevators? Anyone know why you don't use elevators in the of fire? Because you want to go out and you're stuck in them. That's possible. Typical elevators, um, if you, elevators have a smoke detector in the lobby, so what that is is called elevator recall. If a fire smoke detector goes off in the elevator lobby, it's going to de-energize or depowerize that car. It's going to go to a predetermined floor and open its door and not be able to use it unless you have a key. So typically the predetermined floor is the first floor because that's the most accessible exit. You can tell if in your elevator there's a star on the floor, that's your predetermined floor. Now mind you, if that lobby smoke detector and that elevator car goes off on the first floor, it will not go there. That way, you know, it's open to a... Uh, uh, an inferno on the first floor. So you can be on the third floor pushing that button, you're going to wait forever <laughs> because that elevator is never going to come to you until we reset the system. So that's why you never want to use elevators because you don't know where the fire could possibly be or what tripped the fire alarm. Sometimes the elevators may work, but if that elevator gets tripped, then an elevator car is going to be non usable. What take with you? Obviously, Speed is key, so don't be grabbing all your stuff, like your Beanie Babies or whatever's in your office. <laughs> I mean, tools. Your yeah, your tools. <laughs> your, your box of tools. <laughs> so, but there's a couple key things you should always take with you. Your phone, if you have time, your keys, if you have time, your ID, because if you get outside and your building's completely you know, it's going to be a long time. They may send you home. But if you can't throw the keys to your car, you can't really go home. So if you can, always keep your most sensitive items on you, your phone, your keys, and your wallet, and your ID. Because you can pretty much survive without stuff, other stuff in your office. But if you can, make sure you have those things. And when the weather's like this, I assume coats. <laughs> it depends how cold you get. I used to be really hard and never get cold until that winter from like 2014. Yeah. That's why I'm here actually, because I could not handle it anymore. Walking, you know, fire usually you fight that with water. I don't know if you ever fought fire with a day to 55 degrees outside. Not cool. <laughs> that like le legitimately broke me as a as, as a couple of years ago. <laughs> Talk about that all the time, 2014 winter. <laughs> so yeah, coats are very important to take because you don't know how long you're going to be outside for. In fact, if you go outside and you see that, you know, if you actually know it's a legitimate emergency, always just go find another building to go into. You know, try to limit your outside exposure, especially on days like today. Returning after evacuation. So how fire alarms work is the fire could potentially silence the alarm. They push a button in the fire panel and it'll silence the audible signals. The strobes will still flash, because that way they know the alarm's still active, but it's silent. That way they can use radios and know how to hear that annoying voice or sound or whatever that whatever that fire alarm produces. So if you just hear the alarm go off, it doesn't necessarily mean the emergency's over until you actually see the first responders leave and release you. Uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about these. I'm going to be uh, sending a more detailed version of this out to everybody. Uh, the, we're, we're sort of beefing up our floor maps. They used to just include exit strat uh, the quickest path to exit. Uh, we're going to be including uh, fire extinguisher locations, uh, alarm pole stations, uh, and first aid kit locations as well. We're also looking at getting a, um, a defibrillator machine installed in the building, an automatic defibrillator. Uh, and we'll be marking that location as well. We'll be providing some training with that as, uh, additionally, just so that people are comfortable having that around. Uh, and they're pretty, according to Roy, they're pretty uh, straightforward and they walk you through it, but we're, we just want to make sure everyone's comfortable with it. So. Yeah. yeah, so um, in the state of Ohio, you're required to have pool stations by all the ground level exits as well as all the stairwell entrances. So in this building, that's where all the pool stations are. 
and then your ABC fire extinguishers are required 75 feet travel distance. So you're never without a fire extinguisher within 75 feet of where your given location is in this building. Take note where they are. Take note where the second one is too, because sometimes people need take them. Uh, make sure you can pick them up. Sometimes you know they might be heavy or cumbersome. Uh, roughly, I think 10 pounds in this building, each one of them. So make sure you can lift that, get out of the case, or cabinet, or whatever. Um, pretty straightforward on how to use those. Their directions are on there, but we had you offer training, which I believe you're going to take part yeah, in. Yeah, we're also looking at getting. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're looking. Apparently, there's a mobile fire machine truck that they've got to do fire extinguisher training. If you've never shot a fire extinguisher, uh, we were talking about doing it at this meeting, but we figured we'd push till the spring when it's a little warmer out. So <laughs> you're all very welcome. Uh, we're, we'll be hopefully doing something in the spring um, where if you're interested and want to feel what a fire extinguisher feels like to fire off, we'll have hopefully a live uh, exercise for that. So. Yeah. They're cool. They, uh, they fire off this yellow type powder, which basically is very effective in putting out, uh, putting out fires and all applications and things. And AEDs, if you're going to get one, they're very straightforward. You pull off the wall, you open it up. It won't give you, like I can't put it on my body right now and shock me because it won't allow it because I don't have a shockable rhythm. So they're pretty safe. And they, they go over all the directions and things. So getting one is actually a huge, huge benefit, especially if someone were to have an episode. Speed is key in those applications. The only other thing that I'll note is remember that we have the fire gates that come down. As soon as the alarms are pulled, all of the stairwell will close. Um, with the fire gate, but you can still get out the double doors right now. But people may need direction to get there. So like your stairwells are very unique. I've been a code enforcer for a while, and I've never seen them kind of like that application, how they're open but not open, because they have those fire rated doors. So basically your stairwells are still fire rated about four hours if those doors are down. If they're up, they're not rated at all because smoke can still enter the, fire, uh, the stairwell and basically act like a glorified chimney. That's why those automatically close. So make sure you don't put anything that would block that thing from closing in the event of a fire, so like a trash can, things of that nature. Um, as, you, as I said earlier, the, the goal of construction of a building is to go from the least safe to the most safe. So in your office, you're the least safe. You're in the hallway, you're safer, but not safe-ish. Once you get in a stairwell, if it's enclosed, you're at the safest point in the building until you get outside. So you go from the exit, you get to the stairwell, you're in the exit, and then you get outside, exit discharge, you're outside, you're the safest part because you're away from the building. That's why most newer, that's why when you go on new construction, the exits go right outside direct for older construction. They go like in the lobby or the first floor, things of that nature, because they didn't know any better back then. Because <laughs> you're going from a stair stairwell where you're safe, and then you go outside into the lobby and you're not safe there because you're inside the building again. So your outdoor uh, emergency evacuation point or your rally point is, um, I guess it's like a little common green space. Yeah, we're in the little plaza over by the Wexner uh, Center. Yeah. Basically, that's just a great place to locate and make sure everyone's accounted for, depending on where you can make sure you, well, I saw someone here and someone there and get the first responders. Mind if it's cold, go to a different building. Now, if an individual can't use a stairwell, what is the best place for them to do and go? The most rated place in any building is a stairwell. So if you can get it in the stairwell, that's the safest. Now, mind you, you may not want to get them right in there as everyone's trying to rush in the stairwell, because obviously that's going to impede everyone else's egress. So maybe wait until you can get a clear path in that stairwell in the landing, but make sure you tell the first responders outside where they are, and they will come and get them. Don't try to push them down the stairs or carry them out of the building unless you're trained to do so. Um, if you can't get to the stairwell for whatever reason, if you compartmentalize them, like this room, you close both of these doors, there's no fire going in here, they're pretty compartmentalized. The smoke can't enter here at all because it's building room to sit with the doors closed. And you let the first responders outside, they will come and get them right away. So it is depending on what the given situation is telling you. And these are all the predetermined areas of refuge within the building. Uh, they offer the most protection on you. Any room that you can close the doors and seal it off is offers that offers some protection, not the most. So preventing a fire is way better than fighting the fire. So make sure you don't have candles and incense and other things that can burn, open flames, hot plates. 
you see an issue, you can email uh, Glenn Help at OSU.edu, and I'm guessing that goes to you, Kayla. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one thing that, uh, that I learned when we were talking previously about this is if you do have a space heater in your office, it should be on its own uh, electrical outlet. It should not be on a power strip with 20 other things because uh, that just becomes a fire hazard. Per the Ohio Fire Code, space heaters are allowed if they have tip over protection, meaning if you tip it over, it turns off. Easy to find out. Just tip it over, it turns off, tip over protection. <laughs> If it's plugged in its own direct outlet, not into an extension cord or a uh, surge protector or something like that. So one outlet, one item. So it's about protection, and if and it plugs directly in that, and if it, you leave your office, make sure you turn off. I always unplug everything in my house, my wife hates me, but it's all power draw, so why are we paying for free, free power? <laughs> Whatever. Anyone ever seen sprinkler water like go off before? Like anywhere in the building or anything like that? It smells horribly. I said you put you put do not leave valuables in your office for not responsible for sprinkler activations. It smells horrible. Take note of that though, because um, was it last year that OSP had a fire on West Campus? And they had a lot of damage. Some people lost everything that they had at their desk. So be very careful, not only for this reason, but also for theft reasons in the office. Don't keep valuables in your office unless you're willing to toss them if the sprinklers go off. It's not necessarily a problem in here, per se, but residence halls, students like they like hang their uh, clothes from like those heads, or like do chin ups from like exposed pipe and things. So they have a lot of accidental hazards or or some places that play with brooms, like lightsabers. I've seen that before. Uh, and like I said, this one time, as a case, in the dining hall, these people were saying, like, I didn't do it. No, no, no. There's one guy's covered in black sprinkler water. Like, it just smells horrible. Like, I wasn't anywhere near it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this morning at night, just not last night. Yeah. Uh, this is a piece of advice when it comes to space heaters. Mm -hmm. um, we, in my previous employment, I had to uh, bring in building code enforcement twice because of people packing plastic bags and paper around their space. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if they put it underneath their desk, it hit all kinds of other crap underneath there as well. Um, so, um, anyway, just. Yeah, it, per the code, it, it's open to the interpretation of whoever is inspecting, meaning it's like, I think it's like a state of like safe distance from all combustibles, or what does safe distance mean? I don't know. I mean, so I think Ohio State, the code enforcer, Chuck Shirley, that says three feet all directions. So, because uh, you know, interprets the code, three feet. <laughs> so anyone ever used a fire extinguisher before? Pat, you had pass, which is a uh, pool aim sweep, and our uh, pool aim sweep sweep. So a lot of people, they, they go up to the fire and they don't know what to do. So you got to make sure you have that plan in your mind before you use it and actually using one beforehand, not necessarily here, but your own first residence, it's a very important tool to have because I don't know where y'all live, depending on where you live and how fast the fire gets there. They might be saving your basement, or they might be up in your old house, I don't know. Um, so if you can put the fire out, it's a huge advantage. So you pull the pin, that basically arms the device, and then you have a lever, you actually can squeeze that down and you have to sweep the fire back and forth. Some people only hit you know, the left side of the fire. Well, guess what, the right's still full of fire. <laughs> or they might like, spray the top of the flames. Well, guess what's on fire? The bottom of the fire. So you want to strip the bottom of the base of the fire. And you want chairs on fire and all the way back here. It's not going to really get much on the actual fire itself. So, severe weather. You're in the middle of a faculty staff meeting when you receive a Buckeye alert that there's a tornado warning for Franklin County. The way Buckeye alert works for tornadoes and severe weather. If it's a severe weather warning, like a thunderstorm warning, Odd, prompts automatic email from National Weather Service. We have no control on that because we're a storm-ready university. If it's a if it's a tornado watch, automatic email. If it's a tornado warning, automatic text. So watch would always happen typically first. Basically, that what a watch means is their conditions are favorable for a tornado, but none is actually going on right now. A warning is we actually have confirmation one has touched the ground. In fact, so if you get a text, that means there's one nearby. It's not necessarily on top of you, but there's one nearby. 
If it's an email, be on the lookout. So you're getting a text. What do you, would you do? Come away from glass. The most dangerous part of tornadoes is A, being outside, because the tornado can actually throw things at you or take you away, or being in a building near glass or other items that can come towards you. Basically, in here, glass could actually break, and I don't think anyone ever seen someone get mangled by glass. It's not pretty. Uh, so you want to be away from glass. Typically, the lowest part of the building you can get to, so in this building would be your actually ground floor, lower level, and interior part of the building. So the more center, the lowest you can go, the best. So in this building, you have restrooms in the middle. Now you can't put everyone in the building in there, so you have to make some compromises. The stairwells are also another huge benefit because they're closed. They're the best constructed part of the building because they go because they're all fire rated. So you get someone in the stairwell, make sure the doors are closed. You're safe in there. You're safe in the restrooms. You're safe in occupant like um, occupant rooms. They don't have out outer facing walls or windows. Uh, basement's locked. We're not technically allowed. But if there was actually a tornado, I would. <laughs> For himself. Keep in mind, the basement's where our pipes burst um, on a regular basis. That's where a lot of the repair issues happen. And so, in the event of an emergency, you might not want to be near all of that stuff. It's also where a lot of the electrical equipment in the building is. So, it might be safer to stay in the stairwell or back to those areas of refuge in the building. The interior rooms really are. Are we, are are we able to get into the storage rooms on the first floor? In this case, the storage room, like the workroom. There's a couple small storage rooms, in the, like wow. underneath the stairs. Yeah. Oh, oh on the ground floor? Ah, yeah. uh, that's full of paper. So, probably not. <laughs> so, the good big thing about uh, severe weather is be familiar with what it looks like. And it looks like those look like clouds. Well, we ask, Franklin County actually offers a storm spotter class. If anyone's interested, I can get information for that. It's in April at the Boston Center, which is about a two or three hour class when you get certified as a, as a storm spotter. Good, good deal, right? Um, well, the difference between a watches and a warnings are the warnings basically it's confirmed tornadoes on ground. Watch conditions are favorable. Where to go, like elevators again, not good because if you're stuck in an elevator car, not good. Um, this place is on this bathrooms, rooms, lower level, and the secondary entrance. Okay. Um, yeah, go back to a little bit. If you're in um, the two large classrooms on the first floor, mm -hmm. the stairwell's open. Where do you put 70 kids? There's the scramble piece. So it's going to be fitting people where we can get them in. So stairwells first. If they can't get in the stairwells, then it would be the lower level restrooms. If we can't get them there, then they can go upstairs to any of the interior spaces, the workrooms that we have, um, restrooms on the upper level. At that point, it's really going to be making the best decision at that time. But we don't have a good solution for getting 140 people into the stairwells in a minute. Yeah, because, I mean, and the stairwells really don't start until you're off the ground floor. You're on floor one on the other side. Right. The other side. The other side? Yeah. It's not ideal. Obviously, I've never used that stairwell. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing is that our lower level, I mean, the classrooms, the windows are very high. Yeah. So if they need a shelter in place, that's still a good option. Yeah, it's not ideal because the tornado threat in Ohio. Yes, we do have it, but we don't have it to the point where we have tornado safe rooms in every building, like in Oklahoma, or we have areas like outside of like a main campus of places in Oklahoma. They actually have tornado safe areas where everyone will leave buildings to go to and things of that nature. Because we have a threat, but we don't have it to the point where we're there yet. You talked a little bit about that last bullet on the severe weather. I want to encourage students to go to the severe weather shelter, but do not force anyone to stay if they do not wish to do so. You can't force anyone to be where they don't want to be. You can give them the insight and expertise of what the messaging is telling you to do, but if they don't want to, the same thing happened on November 28th. We sent out the shelter in place, and President Drake was in Bricker Hall seeing students just walk around the Oval. Yeah, we saw a lot of that. I mean, there people were, I guess, 
because uh, it was a nice day and they were like, sunbathing or, or something like that. And they were thinking about going out there and getting them and forcing them. Like, well, you can't force someone. You can only give them the messaging and the insight and your expertise and what to do in that event. If someone doesn't want to do those or heed those warnings, it's whatever you feel comfortable with. Me, I'm not going to forcefully make someone stay in this tornado shelter. <laughs> I mean, garages are safe per se because they're constructed very well because cars are very heavy and very tall, things of that nature. But you still have that open air thing where things can get yeah. in there, and, and you have vegetation all around it. So chances are, things from those vegetation is going to get in those garage. So it's safer to be in a building. Than, come back. Yeah. If but not, like, if you actually see a tornado bearing down on yeah, you, yeah, if it's no. like right there, then yeah. you're not. Yeah, <laughs> it's just whatever the given scenario is giving you at that moment, what's your best chance of survival? Like if you're in a car driving in the farmer's field and you see a tornado, get out of your car and go in a ditch. Chances are you'll be safe there, or go into an overpass. But if you can get into a building quick and see, and everything looks okay around you, you get into the building and go to a safe area. Yeah. So I'm just going to do a quick time check. Um, we have until about 10.15. Okay. I can't That's remember right. how many slides we have left. Um, no, it's all about active threats now, so I don't know. That might take some time, but other than that. We just did class and we see the Buckeye alert that there is an active threat on campus and individuals trying to harm others. What would you do? So we sent out a text message, whether that be a generic text message, like Mercy on Campus, Active Shooter, or a more detailed message, which would be follow up in that initial. It can come either way, depending on how much time and what information we have to tell. So, like November 28th, for instance, the initial message was a generic message because we knew it was an active threat. We didn't know what it was because we had radio chatter from the officer on scene. They pushed a button in our comm center and sent out a generic message. And then we had a follow up message once we got further details of what was going on from the officer. That's why you have two messages very quick. So, what we need to do here, get a text message. Emergency on an uh, active threat on campus, active shooter, things of that nature. Lock your doors, turn off your lights, mm -hmm. let people know where you are, get a cell phone, text. So the biggest thing is to secure yourself where you are. If you can, if you look around, I don't hear any gunshots, I don't see any active threat, I'm safer here than I am outside. I'm going to close these doors. I'm going to secure them any way I can. If I have locks, fantastic. If not, well, how do these doors work? These ones pull in, so you can actually secure that door from the top. If they don't, the opposite swing, then you got to figure out how to block those with tables, chairs, things of that nature. You receive another Buckeye alert that individual is actually in your given building, which is page hall. Then what would you do? Try to leave the kid. Well, it depends what the given scenario is. If I hear gunshots and they're close to me, I would try to secure myself where I am. If I hear them far away from me, I would try to evacuate the opposite direction. It all what the given scenario is giving you. Can't there's not like one magic bullet for everything here. It's what the what the given scenario is giving me and the tools I have to fight that given scenario because I like my tools. So if I hear gunshots far away, evacuate. If I hear gunshots close by, secure shelter in place. If I hear no gunshots, I'm like, why is there, what's this active threat? I, I don't hear any noise going on, I don't, I don't know what's going on, I'm just going to secure where I'm at. And please remember that as uh, faculty, staff, and student representatives of Peach Hall, um, you've been trained on this, but probably most of our students have not, or if, even if they have the information, they really don't remember it in the event of an emergency. So please be prepared to guide them through these processes. If we are able to evacuate, do we go to our meeting point or do we just go? It's whatever you, I would not go to, the, the rally point is designed for fire evacuation for accountability reasons, but I would try to get as far away from where the given threat is. <coughs> um, on number 28, people walk on the old tangent bike path up past to like the wet, where the wetlands are, and they're like, I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> That's an OSU building, so they got to that OSU building and they took shelter in there. So. Uh, it's however which you feel comfortable with and where you want to go. Personally, if I hear gunshots here, I'm going to take off and I'm going to run faster than everyone here. Away. <laughs> but that's what I'm going to do. And I would encourage everyone with me to do the same. Yeah. 
there's an active threat, what do we do with the exterior doors? So depending on what the given situation is, we may or may not lock it remotely. The building coordinator may or may not lock those remotely because some buildings have a remote lock that the building coordinator can manage. DPS, we do not lock the exterior doors because we don't want to restrict occupant movement from the outside into buildings to seek shelter. But the building coordinator may do so. So that's whatever they want to do or how they want to protect their own building. Um, if the person, chances are, they're not going to go building to building. Statistically, that's never happened. Um, except for the case of Virginia Tech, but that was a special case because he went from one place and then went to another place with his own pre-agenda, not just, I'm going to go to this building, okay, cool, this building, this building, this building, this building. Um, so, we don't lock exterior doors. However, the interior doors, you should lock. So, the reason why I don't lock exterior doors is because people like to, then they would congregate in the middle of the building and they wouldn't be compartmentalized in different parts of the building. That's what I'm going to So we, we use the run, hide, fight method. Basically, that's not just you shall run, then you shall hide, then you shall fight. It's basically what is the given scenario giving you. If I can get away, I'm going to run. If I can't get away, I'm going to hide and secure myself where I'm at. Okay, if it's do or die, person's coming into my space, I will fight whatever means necessary. So that's your last resort. You're not going to, I'm going to go find this person. No. If that person confronts you, then you go out and confront them. So, I have an escape route in mind. This uh, individual, he's only used one of the two stairways in this entire building. <laughs> so, uh, it's got it. It's always good to know where the stairwells go and which ones you can use. Like he didn't know that was one of the first floor or the ground floor, the lower level. So know where they are, where they go. Um, like uh, student academic service, one stairwell you can actually get out on the high level parking garage. No one knew that happened. I did a training there like, oh you can do that. I'm like, yeah, the safest way. I go instead of going down six flights, go up one and go out in the parking garage. <laughs> you know, you know how this building works, you can use it as a huge advantage in the event of an emergency. Whatever whatever emergency it is. So where the tables go, where the elevator cars go, uh, can I lock doors, can I not lock doors? Bathrooms can I lock those? Um, how the door swings work, how would I secure this door? I mean look around. So that's a good good rule of thumb for running, hiding. Same thing. Where would I hide in this room? How would I secure these two doors? I have are these tables able to be moved? Yes or no? Can I move them? Yes or no? Because like, am I physically able to? Uh, these chairs, can I move those? Um, how would I barricade these 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 doors? Can I lock them? So knowing everywhere I go, I might paint this too when I go to like vacation destinations. I like walk to the hotel before we first thing we do. I know everything about that hotel. <laughs> I take pictures of like all the evacuation signs in your room and stuff, like the floor plan and stuff. Just, I have my phone. Late at night, something happens. I pull my phone out. I know the floor plan of that whole building. This is what I do. We have an awesome award winning and won a uh, an local Emmy video on YouTube. If anyone's not seen it, I encourage you to do so. Yes? All right. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. And just understand this question comes maybe from having been around other campuses. Uh, a lot more people have concealed carry permits. Mm -hmm. What is, I mean, what are people allowed to have on campus? So I was a range paramedic for the NRA basic pistol class. I saw two people shoot themselves. <laughs> In the state of Ohio, to get you can still carry, you need to get a 10-hour basic pistol class and two hours of range time. So people with concealed carry, they act like they're the Marines or the Navy SEALs. Chances are they have 10 hours of training and two hours at the range. You want those people to protect you? No, Personally, I'm just I saying, what is my, uh, you know, I don't want, yeah, I don't want, you know, yeah, exactly. Bozo pulling out a gun and shooting me instead. So, yeah, exactly. That's another problem. People were like, oh, I'm going to take out the bullet. Let's say you're a great shot and you're actually able to take out the suspect. The police are going to shoot you eventually because they're going to see you with the gun. You're like, hey. Uh, so in the state of Ohio, you're allowed to carry your concealed weapon any place without a place guard or on public land. So outside these buildings, you can carry concealed or open carry all you want. But they can't come into these buildings because these buildings are placarded that way. 
So in theory, no one should be in any of these spaces inside the building with concealed carry because they'd be breaking the law unless they have an orthotic exemption from the law enforcement officer. But outside the building, you might see someone that is carrying concealed or non-concealed. However, as an employee, I think also as a student in the code of conduct, you're not permitted to carry. That's correct. So even if you have your concealed carry on campus, um, it would be a policy violation if you are carrying and for whatever reason are found out. Yeah. Andrew, I was just talking to Caleb. Uh, there was a bill in the state legislature to get rid of that mm -hmm. and to like get rid of the placards on doors and stuff. I don't know if it passed. It didn't pass. It didn't. No. Oh. Yeah, I think it passed, but it gives the, the university system the option. Yeah. Oh, right. So the board, right. the board of trustees is given the authority to make the rules in any university, and this so university has maintained the current policy. Right. Okay. Thank Brian Ferrer. Yes, exactly. Who is a concealed carry permit holder? Yeah. I mean, there's some people out there concealed carry. They train all the time. They go to the range and they fire many rounds down uh, down range and they do kind of crazy scenarios and all kinds of stuff I've seen. There's other people out there that have 10 hours of training and two hours on the range and literally I can teach anyone to fire 15 rounds in a 9x9 nine nine paper plate at 15 feet in two hours. So it kind of scares me, but... But I think it's good to remember that there may be people who are carrying in your classroom and just to be aware of it in the event of an emergency. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of like people who come from meetings or like mm -hmm. public safety training and things like that. You know, there are a lot of people I've met who work for government and do work for, who freely admit to me they have concealed carry permits. I don't know if they carry. Yeah. yeah. But you know, I think it's first of all I don't want them firing if there's some idiot around. But you know, I also want to be honest. That, you know, it's just it's it's out it, this. This is just part of the air these days. Everybody seems to be carrying. If you go by statistics, there's more care. If you put all the carry people in the state of Ohio together, you're like the third or fourth largest army, standing army in the world. That's how many people in the state of Ohio have carry permits. Now, how many people carry it versus don't carry it or just have it or sometimes carry? I don't know that answer. But there's a lot of people out there that have yeah. that training, 10 hours and two hours on the range. That they were not carrying guns. Yeah. Andrea, are you saying that even though the students are not supposed to have guns in the building, we should assume that they might be anyway? I wouldn't assume it, but I would say that it's there's a potential for it. Okay. And that's I mean, it's not just our students, but anyone that you have in contact with, just know that in the event of an emergency, there could potentially be something in the classroom that you're not prepared for. Right. But if we discover that someone does have but in the classroom, but it's not making any sort of. Um, you can report that to me because that is a policy violation. But we don't publicly. Or, it's what, whatever the given scenario is. If that person is hard, trying to harm someone. Right. No, yeah, I'm saying that. If you notice not something, and I would do it as discreetly as possible. If you want to notify her, then she can take the appropriate actions, whether that be bringing an officer in there to figure out what's going on. And if you feel uncomfortable, OSU PD is always happy to stop in, and they'll have a conversation with that person. Just to put a fine point on it, we would not encourage you to confront the, yeah. the person with the weapon. Yeah. Okay. So I, I get everything that we're saying, but let's like worst case scenario, there's an active shooter in the building. You lock the door, and then one of your students is like, "Oh, I have a gun. I can protect us." Um, so obviously, if they choose to go and confront that person, that's their choice. Then I lock the door behind them. <laughs> 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 Tell them to. I would tell them to put that gun in the trash can because if the police make entry and see someone with a gun, they will take that individual out. The police, after Columbine, are 100% specialized trained to act, to neutralize that threat. They will walk past someone bleeding out to neutralize that threat because they still hear guns going off. They're going to go for that because they want to end that situation. So if they see someone else, even though it's not a shooter, or maybe it's just a good person with a gun, they will neutralize that person. So. I would encourage them to stay where they are, put that gun in the trash can, or away from them. And we'll deal with that policy violation later. That's what I would do. If they want to go outside, good. I'll lock the door then. That's what I would do.
And if you want to notify police, uh, OSU police about a diversity number that you, the student was in my class, or this thing off, and they run the one night the Rambo outside, do that because they're going to know now there's two people in here potentially. One's good potentially, and one's bad potentially. Again, a quick time check. We just yep. have about three minutes. Gotcha. Um, active threat. Instructor, so stop teaching. Obviously, you don't want to teach while this scenario is going on. Um, do not force anyone to stay in the room if they don't want to. Obviously, you've got to encourage them. This is the information we have. This is what we're going to do. This is the plan. But if they want to, like, I'm out, I'm going, okay. Well, that's your own ability as a hopefully free thinking adult. You want to turn the lights off because most of the time, if someone tries a door and doesn't open and they don't see anybody, they're going to move to the next one, next one, next one. Statistically, five minutes or less. And then that, in, that individual, the perpetrators, the neutralized. Okay, backpack laying on there for several hours. You see, like a backpack, just any sus suspicious package, you can call the 2121 number, which is our comm center number. They're going to send someone to, to investigate. You can call 911, but that's when they go to the state, uh, the city, and then they got route to issue. So if you call 2121, that will get directly to Ohio State, and they'll send someone to investigate that suspicious act. And that's 292 Yep. Um, so this is packages. We are on a campus, so there are backpacks. We leave them all the time. But call them out. We actually have a, uh, a um, Bob K-9 on first shift and second shift. So in theory, we have someone that can readily come and look at those suspicious packages. Different threats. Um, verbal versus... Verbal threats, so someone verbally harassing you, you can call either number one or two twenty one twenty one and they'll send an officer to investigate as well as take any appropriate action if necessary. Don't confront anybody, obviously. Utility hours is probably the most common emergency here. Caleb takes care of those. I assume, right? They go everyone goes to you directly and then you go to service to facilities. Yeah. So medical emergencies, obviously, if you're trained, uh, CPR, AED, things of that nature, you can take action. Make sure your safety is is uh, looked after. Make sure you don't come into contact with any bodily fluids. Make sure you, why did that person fall down randomly? Is it because he breathed in some toxic fumes or something like that? Maybe just a regular heart attack. So make sure you do some situational awareness before you approach that individual. Don't just run in there. Uh, we uh, just real briefly. We've talked. So we've been talking for several years now, but it's never actually happened about doing some some sort of on-site first aid training. Just as a quick show of hands, is that something people in here would be interested in? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, see if, I'll see if I can get that right. <laughs> first aid training is great, even uh, just at your own personal residence, because if you know how to you know, stop bleeding, things of that nature, it's a huge benefit just for yourself or your loved ones. One of the things, sorry, yeah. oh. uh, one of the things that we touched on is staying in communication with your supervisor or your floor coordinator. So if these things are happening, um, notify me, notify Caleb. If it's a building emergency, get your floor coordinator involved. Uh, but your supervisor should be able to assist in helping you remember what's in the beat and get to the appropriate resources. But if these things are happening, keep updating us so we know what the status is and when um, help has arrived and when everything's off here again. Um, just really quick, um, when, I don't know how the emails work or go out, but when we had no water in Pitch Hall a little while ago, none of the PhD students were on that email. Um, so for whatever reason, like someone else in Stephanie Casey Pierce's office got it and sent it to her, she forwarded it to all of us, but we weren't on whatever uh, process that was on. Okay. Like we'll make sure that one slide so I can get the facilities number. Um, I'll probably get Two helpers. They have an online portal too. You can do like calling people because you'll be put on hold for a long time. I gotta call them on game day for things all the time. The online way is the way to go. Distressed or disturbed individuals. Obviously, don't confront anybody. You can um, 
We have counselors on campus. Obviously, this is everyone doesn't talk about. Everyone wants to talk about active shooter and things of that nature. But this is the most common way to <coughs> pass away on college campuses is because of their own suicidal thoughts for whatever reason. Um, so we do have counselors on on campus. They're free for students. If you see something, you should definitely notify that they notify that they actually have resources that are free available to them. And I'll just add a plug here. If you have any students that you have concerns about. Please let Kate or me know, and we'll make sure that you have the appropriate connections to assist that student and yourself. So I got the, the numbers that are emergency. So 911 goes to could possibly go to this, us, but if more than likely go to the city. Make sure you tell them about OSU campus; they'll transfer you, or you can call it 22121 automatically <coughs> connect. Now, mind you, they're going to answer it in a non-emergency type of speak. But you're talking to the same people you would if you talked to call number one. So so stay calm, wait for Buckeye alerts, put those numbers in your phone, no coordinators, supervisors, stuff like that. And then on the actual peep, it actually goes through earthquakes and chemical spills, but we didn't go through those because chemicals are not used in this building in theory, and earthquakes are very rare in the state of Ohio at this current time. Okay, questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.